wonderful book. It fills a vacuum. It will be a major reference, I think, on the Menzies years. May I compliment you on that? There's some questions I wanted to ask you, and one was, I remember reading in a book by Menzies himself that he spoke to the Queen, and this was about appointing Governors General, and it was agreed that he would think up three names, Her Majesty would think up three names, and then they'd have a discussion. That um, <clears throat> story is contained in one of his books, mm. I think in Afternoon Light, and it concerns the appointment of Sir William Slim as the Governor General to succeed Sir William McKell. He was the first of uh, four Governors General that Menzies made recommendations to the Queen about. And uh, apparently that was the method. And the interesting thing is that they came up with the same name through that process, Sir William Slim, who was a very good appointment because he'd been a, a well-respected wartime commander and many Australian soldiers had served under his command and it was an appointment that was warmly embraced. Yes, uh, you say that he should have been the last British Governor General. Yes, I think Menzies should have stopped at Slim. Uh, Dun Russell and Delisle were both very uh, worthy people and they each made a big contribution, but I think it was an error uh, after Slim uh, not to have an Australian as Governor General. Getting back to your book, one of the themes which comes through frequently is Catholicism. Uh, B.A. Santa Maria, Cardinal Gilroy, Archbishop Mannix. Catholicism seemed to be a very important feature of the Menzies year. Well, it's not, uh, it wasn't important in a, in a religious, theological sense, but you had this interesting circumstance whereby the overwhelming majority of Catholics in Australia who were of Irish background voted Labour, not because of their religion, um, but because uh, they were in the main working class people and they naturally adhered to the Labor Party. And it was the gradual disillusionment of so many of them uh, as in an upwardly mobile society created by Menzies, they moved away from the Labor Party and that created a, a greatly changed environment. And of course, um, when the split in the Labor Party occurred, it was as a result of Dr. Evatt, the then leader, in a fit of paranoia, uh, attacking the very strongly Catholic Victorian Labor Party, the groupers or the industrial groups who were Labor people formed to fight the influence of communism in the trade unions. And uh, Evatt became quite paranoid about them. and. Uh, as a result, he made what was seen by many people as a sectarian attack. The influence of Catholicism on the Labor Party had nothing to do with theology. It had everything to do with the simple circumstance that Irish Catholics at that time, who made up the bulk of Australians, Catholics tended to be in the working class and therefore Labor people. Menzies corrected what many Catholics saw as a terrible disadvantage, that is, in relation to education. Oh, yes, Menzies was the Prime Minister who delivered state aid for Catholic schools. And this had become a crushing burden for up to 25% of the Australian population. Mm. The Catholic community maintained its own education system. Mm. And it became a terrible burden because the number of lay teachers required for Catholic schools rose very sharply in the 1960s as the number of people entering religious orders shrunk. And uh, it just became an impossible burden. And here you had 25% of the population paying taxes like the rest of the community, but denied any kind of help in educating their children. And it was unfair. And Menzies was the person who saw that it was unfair, and he did something about it. David Day argued, argues, and he argued in a film which was shown on the ABC, that during the London year, the London months, that Menzies was over there before he fell, during those months Menzies was jockeying for, and there was a move for Menzies to replace Churchill. 
what uh, what uh, strength do you put on that? That claim is nonsense. It's not based on any evidence. Menzies went to London uh, in 1941 to push Australia's case for Britain to become more conscious of the vulnerability of Australia if Japan were to enter the war. And in that respect, he was absolutely right. And he was pursuing Australian interests as Australian Prime Minister at the time. And the thought that he was using the opportunity of being in London to pursue his own political interest in Britain was ridiculous. The British would never have had Menzies instead of Churchill. It only has to be stated uh, to see how ridiculous it was. Uh, at no stage did uh, Menzies want to get out of Australian politics, except perhaps um, after he lost the Prime Ministership, he did flirt briefly with the idea of becoming Australian ambassador to Washington, mm. but the Curtin government was not minded to appoint him. And very shortly afterwards, of course, he he relaunched himself into the Australian political scene by making the famous Forgotten People broadcasts, which became a political testament of his and laid the foundations for his political revival. So we're seeing the birth of yet another myth. Well, that that's means. a myth that uh, I hope is stillborn. <laughs> Indeed. One of, the, one of the things that I've often wondered about is why Labour would never agree unlike the British Labour Party, they would never agree to come into a national government so that the, all parties would be in the same government as you had in London. But when I read Hal Kolbatch's book, in fact, I talked to Hal Kolbatch for years about his stories and encouraged him to publish it, but he had difficulty for years finding a publisher, but he eventually did. I'm wondering, is there a connection between Labour's refusal to join a national government, and the fact that the left and the communists were behaving so badly that Curtin feared that uh, if he formed a national government, it would be a repeat of the First World War, that the Labour Party would split on this, because they could never accept Menzies and his strong views on the misbehaviour of, for example, some of the waterfront unions. Menzies would never have tolerated that had he been in the government. Was that the reason, do you think, that Curtin would not agree, or the Labour Party would not agree to a national government? I think it was a combination of reasons. That could well have played a role, and could easily have played a role, because the influence of the unions in the Labour Party then was very strong. And of course, in the, uh, in the early part of the war, the Communist Party around the world um, saw the alliance between Hitler and Stalin. It was only when... Um, Hitler invaded Russia in June of 1941, that the attitude of communist parties around the world began to change. I think that was a reason. I think another reason was the overwhelming ambition uh, of many people in the Labour Party at the time to be senior ministers, and they didn't want to share the spoils mm -hmm. with others. And, and you'd have to include uh, Dr Evatt and... Um, colloquially known Stabber Jack Beasley, no relation to Kim Beasley, either senior or junior. They wanted power, they wanted power in their own right, and they didn't want to share it with people like Menzies. And they thought that the Menzies government was fragile, and if they held out long enough, it would collapse, and they would have it all to themselves, and sadly that turned out to be the case. He had bad luck, didn't he, with the uh, that aeroplane crash? He had terrible luck. The, the, the aeroplane crash that claimed the lives of uh, a street fair man and gullet, as well as the chief of the general staff, Rudinal White, uh, that robbed him of three capable men who were very strong supporters of his. But it can't be gainsaid that he lost ground every time he faced the public after becoming Prime Minister. He lost the by-election in Corio when Casey was appointed to America and then in the general election of 1940 he lost enough seats that he had to end up relying on the votes of independence. Mm. So he was not seen at that time 
as opposed to what he later became, uh, a great vote winner. You say that he created Australia's most successful political party. You say that you obviously think that the Liberal Party is more successful than the ALP. Well, the Liberal Party is more successful, measured by elections won. The Liberal Party was created in uh, 1944 and it's held federal power for close to 60% of the time and more that's gone by since then. I suppose that's a reasonable measure. But it's a reasonable sense, measure. Yes. I don't know how else you can measure. And of course, uh, Menzies presided over a period of extraordinary growth mm. and expansion in Australia. You say he, he wouldn't have known, or the, the, the term conviction politician wasn't used then, but uh, he was a... He was a politician who was guided by principle. He wouldn't have seen the. He wouldn't want to be in politics if he couldn't have acted on principle. Oh, he was a. He was a. To use the modern language, he was a conviction politician. Mm -hmm. He had very strong views. He acted on them. He understood that you had to win power to do anything. But once you had power, you had to use it. Otherwise, you deserved to lose it. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he was a personification of what we now call a conviction politician, although that was not a term employed in his years. You've uh, repeatedly talked of uh, the Liberal Party being a broad church, bringing together the, the two wings, I suppose Whig and Tory. Mm. But uh, Menzies himself seems to be highly dismissive of small L Liberal. Well, he was certainly uh, very dismissive uh, in a letter he wrote to his daughter in which he, he was almost contemptuous of the attitude of some people in the Victorian division. He said they call themselves small L liberals and uh, he went on to say that people who will say or do anything for a vote. Um, it is important that the Liberal Party understand that it is the custodian of both traditions, the classical liberal tradition, which some people call the, the weak tradition, to use an English expression, and the conservative tradition. Uh, I myself am a mixture of conservative attitudes on things like the monarchy and social institutions, but I'm an economic liberal. I believe in less government, uh, greater influence for market forces, uh, privatisation, deregulation, uh, things that you associate with a classical liberal approach to economic management. The founder of the Democrats, and I can't think of his name at the moment. Don Chip. Don Chip has told me that when he was pretty new to Parliament as a Liberal and he decided that on some point he should cross the floor, he went to Menzies with some trepidation. He was terrified uh, as to Menzies' reaction when he would tell him that he was going to cross the floor and Menzies virtually patted him on the head and said, go ahead and do it. Well, that's a very uh, interesting story of, a, of an indulgent leader who was probably uh, <laughs> thinking of retirement. Uh, 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 I don't know that I would ever have encouraged uh, any of my members to have crossed the floor. Most of the time in the lower house it wouldn't matter, would it? No, in most of the time <laughs> in the lower house it wouldn't it matter. It would matter in the Senate, though. Yeah, it certainly <laughs> matter in the Senate, yes. yes. Uh, you, you mentioned the White Australia policy and the way in which Menzies began the rollback perhaps the end of the White Australia policy. You, remember, you mentioned also the dictation test, which has some personal interest for me because when my, my uh, maternal grandparents and my mother came from what is now Indonesia, they were subjected to, uh, to a dictation test, but fortunately it was in English and they all spoke English perfectly. So we got in. <laughs> you are, they obviously encountered a very benign immigration yes. official. <laughs> and the, the White Australia policy was, it was tinkered with a little bit under Menzies, but the credit for getting rid of it really belongs to Harold Holt. The dictation test was abolished when Alec Downer, the father of Alexander Downer, was the Minister for Immigration, and that was in 1958, and he abolished it. But the real breakthrough occurred in 1966 when uh, uh, people of non-European background living in Australia were given the same entitlements to citizenship uh, as the rest, and then progressively uh, the effective prohibition on, on people of non-European background 
becoming migrants was removed and it didn't begin to have an impact um, until the 1970s because under the Whitlam government, although the Whitlam government continued the process of removing white Australia, it cut the migrant intake so there were very few migrants coming in in the, by the time the Whitlam government ended its final year of office and then it was during the Fraser period that the impact of the abolition of the white Australia policy began to be felt. But the real breakthrough uh, was uh, the Rubicon was crossed uh, under Harold Holt. You, uh, you give some, uh, some credit to, uh, to Keith Winshuttle's view that the installation of the white Australia policy was a fear that the Chinese who came with the gold rush would undermine trade union standards and that, that to, to an extent I think the evidence of that to an extent is the zealotry with which the Labour Party supported the policy. Even down to Cornwall, Cornwall's a, a zealot. Uh, the yes, the, 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 there's no doubt that the white Australia policy was, was based significantly on a belief in the inherent superiority of, of the European race, there's no doubt about that. But it wasn't just that consideration. There was the belief at the time of Federation that uh, living standards and wage levels could be undermined by the importation of so-called cheap labour from Asian countries, particularly Chinese. Now, that was the belief. Uh, it's easy now, more than 100 years later, to look back and say how absurd it was and, 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 and it was unjustified and if you read the debates uh, you can understand how unreasonable some of the concerns were but you can also understand that it wasn't just a sense of racial superiority, although that was important to some, uh, to others uh, they genuinely worried about it and the union movement maintained that zealotry. And you mentioned Arthur Call. Well, Arthur Call was one of the uh, the last standouts against the White Australia policy. He never reconciled himself to its removal. Never, and uh, he remained a supporter of the of a White Australia policy till the day he died. In the book, you mention uh, Menzies appearing in the High Court as a very young barrister in the Engineers case, and Isaac Isaacs must have been delighted when he proposed uh, arguing against the reserve powers doctrine. But it, it opened up the gates of centralism, certainly, I, I would say. The, the High Court then moved. Well, there's certainly the, the, the engineer's case uh, opened up a, a new uh, avenue of Commonwealth power. And uh, it, 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 was, and it was a case that I, overturned the first 20 years of thinking that mm. the, the, the Commonwealth uh, couldn't automatically pick up state instrumentalities with its laws. But uh, the High Court accepted Menzies' argument, which uh, was to the effect that if uh, uh, a law was, uh, had, a, had a, a general application, uh, a state could not um, be exempt from its reach simply because it was a state instrumentality. Now, later on in the, in the state banking case, uh, the High Court was seen to have slightly qualified the engineer's case, but the difference there was that the sole purpose of that legislation was to strike at state banks. Mm. Therefore, it could be seen as discriminatory mm. and not a law that had general application that happened along the way to pick up state instrumentalities. That was the difference. But, it was a very significant win for a 25-year-old barrister. He Quite extraordinary. Extraordinary win, and he claimed, uh, incidentally, to have got married on the strength of that victory. <laughs> uh, and uh, certainly, if you look at the chronology, uh, there's, there's some truth in that. The other interesting thing was that uh, his master, who, or his, his, his mentor master, the person to whom he'd been a pupil at the bar, was uh, Owen Dixon, who later became, of course, person regarded as our probably greatest, our greatest jurist, mm. uh, Dixon uh, was on the other side in the engineer's case. Talking of greatest, and I might conclude on this point, 
present company accepted, <laughs> who, in your opinion, was the greatest Australian Prime Minister? Oh, I think Menzies uh, uh, was, was certainly the greatest. Uh, uh, I think amongst Labour Prime Ministers, I think Hawke uh, was the best. Hawke was certainly significant. I, I yeah, it's I, I'd, I'd, amongst yeah, Labour Prime Ministers, yes. I'd rank him ahead of the others. Yes. But certainly Menzies, I would put yes. ahead of all of them. I would uh, discount Curtin, having read Hal Colbeck's book. I, I, think, uh, I think in many ways Curtin, a very good man, failed in trying to handle the treachery of some of the unions. He certainly had a terrible problem with the unions. He nonetheless uh, gave uh, some very good leadership during World War II and I certainly acknowledge that in my book. Very difficult to rank people who you haven't worked with or known or mm. been alive when they mm. were in charge. Uh, uh, it's relatively easy in my experience uh, with Labor Prime Ministers to rate them because the Labor Prime Ministers I've effectively known uh, Whitlam, Hawke, Keating, Gillard, Rudd and it's quite easy in my opinion to pick Hawke out from that group. And I said I was going to finish but may I ask another, your indulgence, and that is uh, relations between political leaders seemed to be better at the time of, say, Menzies and Curtin and Chifley than in later years. Is that a reasonable conclusion? Most of the commentary says that Menzies and Curtin and Menzies and Chifley had a good relationship. Certainly Menzies and Evatt had a bad relationship. They had virtually none at all. It said, again, that Corwell and Menzies got on reasonably well. I suspect that it was a relationship that matured after both of them had left Parliament. Um, that seems to happen a bit. Uh, Gough Whitlam and Malcolm Fraser seem to have become reasonably friendly after mm. they both left Parliament. I'm not sure that it's not a case of uh, distances has given uh, a luster uh, to an attitude that perhaps wasn't quite as intense as people now think it was. And in the Australian system, you're so close and fighting in question time in particular. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 the system mandates antagonism. Yes. And I saw that with Mitt Romney and Obama. Obama, in that first debate, in that television series of the presidential debates, Obama wasn't able to handle questions. He wasn't used to the sort no, of things no. that a prime no, minister no, they're not. They're, would no, be used to. American presidents, um, they declare they don't advocate. It's a, it's a significant difference. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the absence of the discipline of parliamentary procedure and parliamentary question time means that American presidents are not trained, so to speak, to constantly argue the case for something. Yes. And um, I, I just became painfully you know, obvious to me in observing both Bill Clinton and George Bush, uh, each of whom had enormous qualities, but they weren't, in the nature of the jobs they had, they weren't required to uh, constantly argue the nuance of every particular position they were taking. Perhaps another justification for our Westminster constitutional monarchy. And well, certainly a very, very, very strong reason not to have a presidential system. Very strong. <laughs> and on that point, uh, thank you very much. That is a wonderful book. Thank you. I'm enjoying that. Thanks, David. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you.